us this morning. But um, we're going to talk this morning uh, on a lesson that the Lord gave me. I hate this microphone, but um, we're going to talk about the cost of compromise um, and how much it's going to cost us if we choose to compromise or what compromise is going to um, result in. And it says, while Satan and his L's uh, boost about the advantages of compromise and, and broad mindedness, the scriptures warn of the horrible cost of compromise. Um, and so the cost of compromise, uh, we're love, not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the father's not in him. That's found in first John two and 15. Our scripture text goes in in Genesis 13, 7 through uh, 13 and 18, 20 through 21. I am going to ask some of y'all to help me read this morning so that I'm not monotonous and uh, any more boring um, this morning. So, uh, Sister Nora, if you'll start out for me, uh, if you'll read 7 through 10, and then if you'll pick up Sister Kathy on 11 through 21, I'd appreciate that. All right, so the cost of compromise, and we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, and we're talking about Lot and Lot's wife, and a lot of us already know the story about Lot and his wife and how, but I, um, I'd like to dig in into the, uh, the lesson and, and dig into what the Lord gave us this morning about the cost of compromise, and a lot of us already know that when you compromise, it comes with the cost, but when we are in the act of compromise, we forget about the cost of what it's going to cost us. The devil blinds us from those things. The devil has been the devil has been man's adversary ever since his work in the Garden of Eden. He has tried with all of his might to cause men and women to disobey God and live live in sin. He is not able to keep them from becoming Christians if he if he's not able to keep them from becoming Christians, then he tries to hinder them from their spiritual life and he tempts them to compromise the principles and precepts of God's word. He tells them that they still are, that they still can be Christians, but that they can, but they do not have to take God's word quite so seriously. Many people have listened to the devil's lies and have backed and have backed up on their commitment to God and his word. Instead of finding peace and blessing, those who compromise have found error, misery, and sin. 
Oh, may God help us to be dedicated before the Lord. And I'm skipping around a little bit. I know I don't want to read exactly, exactly straight from the lesson because I know it gets boring. That's why us teachers study so that we can hit the highlights. And that's why I make y'all paper so you can go home and study. Um, I want you to study out the lesson. The objective and the reason for the lesson is to try to show you the gradual pro uh, progression of uh, compromise and what compromise does and the terrible cost that it is to compromise. Um, if there wasn't a cost to compromise and if compromise wasn't in the church, we wouldn't be teaching on compromise. If the Bible didn't say many 2,000 million trillion, it seems like years ago when the Bible was written that, you know, that in the last days there'd be a great falling away, Jesus knew. God knew that there was going to be a great falling away. And boy, do we not see it in this day and age. There will be a great falling away. Compromise means a mutual concession. Now, I want you to understand the reason and what compromise is. A mutual concession in spiritual matters, and it means a concession on the part of the believer, but never the part of God. God never compromises. God never changes his mind. God's words never changed. When he tells us something, he never wavers or changes. He never decides to change his mind. He never says, well, I'll let up here. Will I change your mind for this Christian? Well, I don't mean it for Sister Myers now. I meant it only for, for Sister Tammy. I just, I mean, when I meant it then, I'll just ease up on you. When you stand before me in heaven, I'll just ease up on you. God didn't change his mind. It's always on our part, never on God's part. God's never changed his mind about his word. He's forever settled in heaven. People compromise God's word and allow their lives to come short of God's standard. But God makes no concession. That's why compromise is so dangerous. God does not move, but men move away from God. You may decide that you are doing all the things right and you can go ahead and you can keep doing it. At the same time, God has not decided to change his mind or that you have or have not changed your mind and what he's changed his mind for because he's never changed his mind. God don't change his mind. Um, you will still be judged by what he decided to do for what his word was in the beginning. You'll still stand before him. Beware of compromise. It's very costly. When you decide to compromise, it's going to cost you. Our, our number one thing says progression of compromise. It talks about the story of Lot. It's a classic example of the progression of compromise. How backsliding does. It doesn't doubt. Um, that you can, you know, it says you may not doubt that you've heard that people um, cannot backslide overnight. And that circled somebody that studied this before me has underlined things and circled things. Um, can't backslide overnight. It says that's very true. There's always a progression. Although we often only see the final failure. People say, oh, well, they, you know, they're backslid. Well, it didn't happen overnight. You don't see me today, and I go home, and when you see me on Thursday, I'm backslid. It didn't happen overnight. It was a gradual progression. It was already happening. We're going to get into that too. Before he fell away, there was a the before he fell away from the faith. Visibly, he was falling away from the faith some somewhere else. It almost always starts with the decline from prayer and studying God's word. Usually there's a decrease in, God, in church attendance. There's an increase of worldliness. You must guard against gradual lessening of spiritual desire and power. You stop coming to church. You stop going around church people. You don't want people telling you what to do. You don't want to talk to people that are around God's, you know, around the Lord. People get, you know, I, I've had, you know, Brother Myers and I, you know, they just say, I just don't want to be around Brother Myers and Sister Myers. I just, they get on my nerves. You know, it's not us, but we do get on people's nerves. 
I get on his nerves all the time. He'll tell you I get on his nerves. And he, he gets on my nerves too. Don't let me, don't, you know, he, he does. But I love him. My kids get on my nerves. But that don't mean I'm going to backslide or that, I'm, or that, you know, things are happening. But I've told my kids before. You can ask Justin. He'll get up or he'll, he'll be doing something and, I, and I'll be going through. And a lot of times I'll be like, wait a minute. Come here. What, mom? What? Look at me in the face. What? No, look at me. What? Look at me in the face. What, mom? No, in the eyes. What? Say, there's something going on with you. Ask my kids if I, if, let's say there's something going on. Because if you're spiritual enough, and I'm using this in a physical sense, if you're spiritual enough, you can look at somebody and you can go, something just ain't right with them. You know, there, something just ain't right with them. Something just, that just ain't right. Not too long ago, me and Brother Myers went out to eat with, with some people from church. And we got home, and I told Brother Myers, I said, such and such is on the way out. He said, what do you mean? I said, they got smarty with me at the table, and they ain't never done that before. I said, they've always been respectful. They've always been good, and they got smarty with me at the table. And I said, there's a spirit there. They've allowed a spirit to come in, and that spirit wouldn't be there if the Lord was there. I said, you, you've allowed, they've allowed the devil, and this is a progression. I said, their heart's gone. They're pretending. Because sometimes we hide against the mask of what you see on the outside. Because, see, when we're not reading and we're not praying and we're not, we're hiding against the people that see us on the outside. So, anyway, we're going we're to jump past that part. So, A says, go ahead, You're exactly right. Sure. And those things just keep building and building until finally you're away from God. Sure. But it's the devil that deals with the mind. And God deals with the heart. And we're fixing to talk about that when we talk about the 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 right here where it says Lot looked to Sodom. And it talked about how he looked, and we're fixing to talk about that. A says, Lot looked to Sodom. And it talks about Genesis 13, 10. It says, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld. Compromise begins with the look. So we look at it and we go, oh, it's not so bad. So it's like us taking the demon and we bring it in and we put it in our little salon chair and we brush its hair and we put little bows in its hair and we put little makeup on its face and we, well, it's red and it's got horns on it. So we, you know, put little bows all over the horns and we hide it. And that's what we're doing spiritually. We're babying the demon up and making it look a little better and we're because we're looking at it and we're entertaining that look. And it talks about how, and I want y'all to go in and dig all this out because I already have. I don't want to bore you by reading just right off of here, but it talks about when you, when you look upon a woman in lust, you've committed adultery in your heart already. So it talks about when you look, you're looking at it and you're entertaining that thought. Okay, so when you look upon sin, you entertaining the thought. I mean, when it talks about a man, it could be a woman too. I mean, when I'm scrolling through Facebook and, you know, there's worldly people that, I mean, I got some family on Facebook that I know that I got to block sometimes, you know. But if I, they have something up on there, you know, and I don't keep them on there because I want to see their junk on there. If I keep them on there because I want to see the junk they put on there, I've already got them on there for the wrong reason. But that ain't why I keep them on there. I've got somebody on there, one of my family members, that I'm really trying to reach out to, and they're really, for the first time in all these years, being receptive. 
So they're actually reading the things that me and Brother Myers are putting up there scripturally. So I just <clears throat> unfollow their feed. But there is times that there's stuff I put up there. So if they put some guy up there that maybe women too, because it says when a man, because a lot of times people say, well, that's just for men. No, it's for women too. Let me tell you the difference real quick. Okay, let me tell you the difference that I'm a woman. When a man looks on a woman, they do this. They just look. When a woman looks, they go. It's the truth. They look just like they ain't looking. They look too. Let me tell you something. They do. They sure do. So it's for both of us. But if I'm waiting to look and I stop scrolling or I stop standing and I look and I'm lusting, then I'm wrong. I've committed adultery in my heart already. So it's the look of entertaining the thought. If I'm looking on sin and I'm entertaining that thought, I've committed that sin in my heart already. It goes for more than just adultery. It goes for anything. So Sodom looked at him, or looked at that. I mean, yeah, he looked at Sodom and Gomorrah and he entertained the thought of the sin. He entertained that. He thought about, and y'all know Sodom, what Sodom and Gomorrah was. It was full of homosexuality. I mean, you call it like it is. And the problem with it is he called them brethren. He called them one of his. He brought, he, he, like it was his brothers or sisters, instead of calling them, calling it sin, he called them brethren. There's a problem with that. Like they, he called them, it wasn't that he called them like he wanted to see them saved or he wanted to see them brought through. He wanted them to be, he, he was patty cake in that sin. So we're still talking about the cost of compromise. He was looking at that and making it okay. It's not okay. So B says Lot chose. He chose to look because it was a choice. It was his choice. He looked upon it. He, he uh, entertained the thought and he chose to look. <clears throat> so we are jumping through this. It says choice. choice um, some people blame choice and happenstance on the condition of their life. But the fact is a choice. Not chance determines human destiny. It's your choice. When the Lord made, when God made all of us, he made us with the choice. Why do you think he made us? Has anybody ever thought about it? It ain't no, you know, boom, he made us. He made us to love him and he made us with the choice. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to make all of the beings, these, you know, and they're going to have a choice whether to love me or not. And do you realize how heartbroken they are? Same heartbroken we are when our children choose to do things that they, we don't want them to do. It's our, it's, it's that choice. So when we choose to entertain the thoughts of backsliding or compromising, we choose to Walk away from him. He hasn't changed his mind like we already talked about. So C says, Lot moved toward Sodom. He pitched his tent toward Sodom. He maneuvered it so he could see. So that's like me making my place so I could see, like we were talking about less than after, so I could see just the right angle of the sin. He knew what he was doing. We know what we're doing. We may say, oh, well, I just want to let everybody know. Normally when we're, when we're justifying it, we're justifying it because we know somebody else is going to see and they're going to wonder. We're justifying it for a reason. He pitched his tent towards Sodom and then I can just see him looking at his wife and go, well, you know, the reason why I pitched my tent towards Sodom was because, you know, the wind blows better this way. And, you know, I can cool the tent off better. The wind blows better. You know, you know, honey, that's the reason why I pitched my tent towards Sodom. 
It's really not because I want to see the sin and I'm entertaining my mind and my lustful thoughts, but I pitch my tent because the wind blows this way. And all of his children are seeing what mama and daddy are doing. And all of his lintage and all of his heritage are seeing this. And that's what I think we're not realizing when we compromise is we're losing everything. There's a great cost to compromise. So he moved towards Sodom. He justified living towards, moving towards Sodom. He dwelt in Sodom. And he eventually sat at the gate of Sodom. Right at the gate, he sat there at the gate of Sodom. How disgusting. But you know, we live in our sin. And you know how disgusting that is? When we compromise, we're, we're in the church and we can see from the outside when we look in and we go, that's disgusting. Yeah. But other people can't see that it, they can't see in themselves because they've justified those things. You know, and his wife's probably going, well, it's not so bad because my husband right. is a godly man. And he really was just pitching his tent to get some air. And, you know, I did feel a little bit of air when he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Because you know the devil let the air blow towards that way. Because you know the devil had part in that. Lord, have mercy. Okay, F says, Lot calls Sodomites brethren. We talked about that. So just part of him. What is brethren? Brothers and sisters. He called the homosexuals brethren. Sick. Disgusting. It's sin. So he called them brethren. It says, if we had talked a lot, he first chose to pitch his tent towards Sodom. He said to them, you know, you know, you know, Lot, if we start moving close to Sodom, you're going to tolerate and condone your ways. Lot would have become very defensive if you'd have told him that. He'd have become angry. He would have, he would have said, no, I don't tolerate homosexuality and perversion. You know, he would have been angry and, and, He'd have probably flipped his lid if his wife told him that. But this is what I want everybody to realize. I wrote this on my Facebook yesterday. This is so true with compromise. When a ship is loose, it begins to drift. And it just drifts a little bit. And it drifts a little bit. And it drifts a little bit. And it drifts a little bit. bit Until it's so far out. Till it's lost, flat lost out in the sea. And it's so far from the safety that it's already compromised and don't even realize how far it is from safety. That's what happens when we compromise. That's what happens when we allow ourselves to drift. When we don't read and we don't pray and we don't do what we're supposed to, we start drifting. And then we become shipwrecked Beware of the progression of compromise. Stop drifting away and return to the place where you know is safety within God's word and his will. We just keep drifting and drifting and drifting and drifting. If you don't think it's true, turn around and look at the church. In the last days, in the last days, there'll be a great falling away. Have you not seen a great falling away? Let me tell you how true it is. Yesterday, last night, Pastor and I come up here to the church. I'm laying right here on the floor, praying. Pastor's laying right there on that pew, right where Breston's, Justin's sitting, or where that came from. We're praying, seeking the Lord, and right here in the church, it's like a fog, like a just... Just blah. I mean, how else can you, how else can you ex- explain it? Just a, just a fog of discouragement, blah. So I prayed for a while and prayed for a while and prayed for a while. And I, 
looked over at pastor and I said, something, I don't even remember what it was I said to him. He said, I just, it's like, blah. I said, I know. I said, but you know what? I said, let me tell you something. I just got sick of the devil. You know, sometimes you just got to shake yourself and encourage yourself in the Lord. Just shake yourself and say, what are you here for? I said, you know what? When Shama stood up and said, this is my little patch of peas. Why did he defend that patch of peas? How come he stood up and everybody else gave away their patch? Why did he do that? You're right, Nora, but why else did he do that? Because he said, this is my patch of peas against the devil. And if I let him have this little patch of peas, what else is he going to take? He's going to take my kids. He's going to take my land. He's going to take my city. He's going to take my everything. I looked up and I told pastor, I said, I refuse to let him take my patch of peas. This is my patch of peas. This is my place. I said, no. I got up. I took that oil right there. I anointed everything. I was like, like I was stupid. I don't care. Let me tell you something. I look around the church this morning. I see people in the blood. I told pastor, I said, that fog that's on us. That's the same fog the devil put on. And I started naming the people. <clears throat> the devil's done throughout on compromise and backsliding. I said, that's the fog that he put on this one and this one and this one and this one. I said, he ain't putting that fog on me. That ain't from God. I said, I am not going to do this. Forget it. I ain't doing it. You have to sometimes encourage yourself in the Lord and say, I ain't allowing it. If you're going to compromise, you're choosing hell over the Lord. It's your choice. You can choose it if you want to, but you're choosing Sodom over heaven if you choose that. Sickening, sickening, sickening. Sin's a progression. It's It's a drifting progression. And the price of compromise, the devil sells compromise like a salesman in Florida, he, the, he gave an example. And he says, there's this plot of land in Florida, and it's this beautiful oceanfront property. And you buy the land, and it's swamp land. That's exactly how the devil works. Look at this beautiful patch of, of grass here. It's just beautiful. It grows beautiful. And if you give up everything, you can have this beautiful patch of of grassland. It's just gorgeous. And you walk over on the grassland and you sink into the septic tank underneath the grassland because that's where the grass grows. The beautiful grass grows on top of the septic tank. That's where, I mean, nowhere, anywhere I pull up to, that's where the grass is the prettiest. I always tell Brother Myers, well, there's the septic tank. Because that's where the grass grows the prettiest. That is where the septic tank is. I mean, it's the truth. That's what the devil shows you. It's a lie. People are believing the lie of the devil. It's ridiculous. The price of compromise, the devil will do anything. And the problem is, it's so costly. It ain't just, it ain't just Lot that's dealing with it. He loses his wife in a pillar of salt. She turned around and she had to turn around and look one more time. You can't take all that and, and, and look at Lot's wife and say, oh, you know, she was just an ungodly woman. It's Lot's fault, some too, for pitching his tent towards Sodom. It's her fault just as much. I don't give it just a lot, but I'm telling you that it was an example that was, that was put up there. Okay, A says he lost him. It, lo- it cost him his conviction. I've got to hurry up. All his convictions, it cost him his convictions. He lost everything because he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And I want you to go back and read. Please go back and read and and pray over this and seek the Lord over this and, and ask the Lord to help you because I don't want you drifting. 
You know, I could stand up here all day and beg and beg and plead and plead and plead and beg for you not to get on that drifting train, but if you're going to drift, you're going to drift because you're already drifting if you choose to. I can't stop you from it. That's between you and God, but you're going to give up heaven over wanting to just give up everything. It's not worth it. If, you, if you'd have told Lot years before, he would have been offended and angry and upset and, and frustrated and, and offended that you would tell him such a thing. But he did just exactly what he would have been upset about. It cost him his godly influences. It cost him his zeal. It cost him his peace. And it cost him his wife, his, his kids, his everything. It cost him everything he had. And it was not worth it. Absolutely not worth it to give up everything he had to, um, for the cost of, of the compromise, to compromise everything for um, sin. Sin, it, it looks pretty on the outside because that's what the devil does. Like I said, you take that demon, you can, you can try to pretty it up and make it try to look great if you can... Uh, make it try to look great because demons ain't beautiful, but you can try to, and people try to make it look great if they want, but it's just the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. Anybody got anything they'd like to say? I think I've talked enough this morning. No. And I think to be aware of that and to try and remember how things were when, when your life falls apart, I think that's the most useful tool to just keep alert to that one point. Exactly. And let me tell you one of the biggest lies the enemy tells you is it's God's fault. Everything happened to you, it's God's fault. And let me tell you, it, the things that's happened to me in my life, the devil tried to convince me that God did it to me, it's a punishment. God did it to me because he was mad at me and he's punishing me. That's exactly what the devil tried to tell me. And I've seen it time and time and time again. People say, well, I just feel like I'm being punished by the Lord, that my faith wasn't big enough. No, it happens. It, it happens. That's why this world, it's, not, it's unfair. It, you know, I say it all the time. The devil don't play fair. We're not playing in a fair race. You know, when you tell kids, you know, play fair, play fair. And then they grow up and then you're adults and you say, life ain't fair. Your job ain't fair. People aren't fair. People don't play fair. The devil ain't going to play fair. You know, there ain't a fair fight. He's going to pull out, you know, you're fighting with, you know, with fists. He's going to pull out the machete and cut your head right off. He ain't going to play fair. It is... The will of God to stay in his word, to stay prayed up, to stay fasted up, and to surround yourself with godly people. And when things happen, it did not come from God. You know, I said the same thing. I've had people tell me, well, God didn't warn me it was going to happen. God didn't warn me it was going to happen either. Because if he'd have warned me that things were going to happen to me, I'd have told him, no, God, don't do it to me. But even Jesus felt forsaken. If he didn't, why did he say on the cross, God, 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 why did thou forsaken me? He said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? If he didn't feel forsaken, why did he, why was he on the cross and say that? Because he felt forsaken. He felt like he was left alone. But he died on the cross feeling forsaken and feeling left alone and still took the stripes for us and still died for us feeling that way. 
So we're not no different. You know, we, we say, oh, but he can't live. I've had people tell me, oh, but he could, Jesus didn't live through what we did. Yes, he did live through what we went through. The devil don't play fair. He's not playing fair. This is the end of our race. And yesterday when I was down here praying, I thought, you know, you did run well. When I stand before God and he says, who did hinder you? It's going to be, when I stand before God, I'm not going to be able to say, come here, such and such, you hindered me. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. You hindered me, come here. God, God, they hindered me. They hindered me. They hin- this one, she hindered me. She hindered me. He, he hindered me. Like we're tattletaling like our kids do. You know, when Maddie comes to me and says, Justin, Justin took my candy from me or whatever. We can't tattletale to, to God. When we stand before God, we stand before God alone. I'm not going to stand before him with my husband and say, but, you know, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And I just had to look back. I'm sorry I turned her into a pillar of salt. I just had to look back. But it's Lot's fault. It's all, it's all Lot's fault. No, I'm going to stand before God for me. I'm going to stand before God because of the choices I made. You know, Lot's wife is probably thankful today that she's in the word of God to warn people. If she was here today, she'd probably say, you know better. You've seen what happened to me. We've got no excuse for the word of God telling us what's happened to live this day. We should be so thankful for the stories that we've heard to not live for God today. You're exactly right. We know better. Anyway, uh, Brother Benefield. Exactly, Justin. Uh, we have to look in the mirror and say, wait a minute, you're the one that's obeying. We're the one that's obeying. We're the one that's doing what he's attempting us to do. We're not going to be able to stand before God if we don't make it the same way the devil made me do it. That's right. We did it because of the deep justice, yes. But we in our own mind peace to that. I always look in the mirror. It's always me. Nobody else. I felt it's me. I got to repent. The devil ain't going to repent. And he don't care. He'd like to see us follow after him. Right. And do whatever he would have us right. to do. Right. Not what God would have us to do. Not what our own heart really tells us to do. To follow God in his word. Yes, at times it gets hard maybe. Because the world out there is drawing us away. Satan is using others to reach out try to get us. Using our family members. Use your friends. It's not always just the enemy out there that's across there wanting to kill us. It's our own family members sometimes that will do things. Yes, we are to keep the victory. And no matter what, we're not going to stand before God as a couple or as a family. We're going to stand in All alone. You better believe it. That's what I said. Oh, right. We're not going to make it individually. We will stand ourselves either guilty or innocent. And we're living for him. If we live for him, it's going to be us. Nobody else is going to be with us. We never, that family parts are dead. It's really part of that. Exactly. It. And they ain't going to be in heaven together. They ain't going to be in hell together. When you get going to be individually. And I can tell you something. Hell is a place where you're not going to say, well, you made me do this, so I'm just suffering because... No of way. No, we're going in there because of our own minds. Right there in between these ears is where all of our decisions are made. Yeah. Not in this heart. The Bible talks about the heart. He ain't talking about this pump. He's talking about this brain. That's where it's all at, is in the mind, in the brain. And I, this morning, we better get ourselves set straight. Do we have problems? Yes, we do. Sure. Do we have disagreements? Yes, we do. But the thing is, do we live on it? Do we hold on to it? Or do we go ahead and if we fail each other, do we repent and go on? But right. if we fail God, do we repent? Do we truly, instead of trying to blame the devil? Right. we got to remember something. He, he, can't, he Yes, he's the one that tempts us. Yes, he's the one that shows things up before our eyes. And he's the one that most makes us this and that and the other. But to get us to look at these other things. Like you said, a flock had another look. At the plane, look at Sodom. 
Now, where did he get all this? I wondered about that. Where did he ever see this? Where did he ever see this before? But he said, look on it. Now, the weird thing is, we look on things. And the thing is, how long do we look? How long do we keep our mind on it? How long do we focus on it? And is it the things of the world that we want it because we, it's something we just desire to have? Or is it something God has been pleased with us? Right, have? right. So we, it's individually. It's right here in this same frame. It's right there. And, and, and some of us, we're losing out on that frame. But thank God this morning, we really we realize where it's all at, then we got a better chance of making it. But we say the devil knows the way it is. We'll stand before God for ourselves. Good lesson this morning. All right, let's um, let's all use the bathroom um, and get back in here, prayed up, ready for our service this morning. Everyone wants to take an opportunity to use the restroom. We're going to transition our service this morning. And uh, like for you to get ready for having a good time in the Lord. Worship. You didn't? I was getting a little upset there. Until you got to the end? Oh boy. What you doing there, Mr. Brother I Man? Just, I just snuck, I just snuck in the back here. Good, Good to see you. Good to be here. Transfer somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> she goes, no. Boy, you missed a good Sunday school lesson. You got to get out of bed earlier, brother. You got to get out of bed earlier. Start getting up at six.
So what you do, you just stand here and you hold it. If it gets where it's like kind of getting tiresome, you can use this right here to help pop it up. I'm going to have to try and see a clip or some sort of thing. But you want to be able to use this in this thing here to that so it's red. It's like that. So all you have to do is make a line. Make sure that make sure that you don't go. Good to see you, my brother. If I get to, if, if I'm gonna see you a little more often, I want you to start working on that. Uh, maybe maybe we can practice something. You, you have know, a, like do you have a tablet? Timing. Yeah. Do you have a uh, you have a tablet? I got one at the house. You can get some of them songs. You bring it, bring it, and I'll put some songs on for you. And that way you can start uh, no. learning the songs, and then we'll have to get together sometime. And, yeah, because you know timing, music's timing. The more you, totally the more you get. So like my brother's you, a guitar player. I'd like see you sing a little more. Yeah, man. Thank you, Pastor Joe. Yes, hey, you know what I mean? I want to come to a place where I ain't just got a sign out there that this is church. Yeah, you can have church. I understand. Well, you pray for us because we... We, we sure want to have six foot eight. Good morning, my brother. Hey. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning, Sister Tracy. Good morning, good morning Sister Ray. I know every song's picked out. I don't know where you picked out anything or not. As long as they ain't dead, that, that's good. Yeah. She knows what I like. I don't like no dead. We're going to die. We're bearing up a Fred. But Jesus helped this kind of song. No dead song. She knows. That's so bad. God. <laughs> Who is life this morning? I'm going to try that one more time. I said, who is life this morning? Let's do it one more time. I said, who is life this morning? Jesus. Life and life evermore. He is the life. He is what keeps us moving, going. And when you're a child of God, that fire that burns on the inside of you is a product of the fact that he is life. He takes over the deadness of our soul and he introduces new life to us. Many folks, they don't quite understand it. They didn't fully understand or comprehend it in the Bible whenever they began to, Nicodemus said, what do you mean by that? Said, you're going to, said, you're going to be born again. Said, you think I'm going to get back in my mother's womb? I mean, look how big I am. That ain't even possible. And uh, he said, no, that's not what I'm talking about. You must be born of the water and born of the spirit. 
And you know what that means. You know this morning we must be born of the Spirit. When you're born again, that means you've been saved. And uh, it's a brand new experience, a brand new birth. That means I started all over again. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Now there's a modern day thinking that says you get born again and you keep your old ways, your old thoughts, your old aggravating spirit, the old frustration spirit, and you, and you keep on doing your old sinful things and nothing changes. I don't believe that's possible. You can't pour a bottle of bleach on a garment and expect it, unless it's already white, to come away not discolored or, or bleached out. And that's the way it is. When the Spirit of God comes into your life, it's like dumping a bottle of bleach in a, on a pair of black slacks. It's going to do something. It's going to make a change. There's no way that it can happen without making some change. And I'm glad this morning that I can report to you that He has made a change in my life. And the good news is, is that even though I've been saved, there are times after I've been saved that I needed him to pour a little more bleach in there, to do a little bit more work on me. And I'm, I'm able to tell you this morning that even in difficult times, he is a strength giver, he is a life giver, he is a, he is a savior, a sanctifier, a baptizer in the Holy Ghost, he's a deliverer, and I'm glad he's a forgiver. Aren't you glad for that? Because even after you've given God your everything, there are times that you may slip and you may fall flat on your face, and he's there to give you mercy and to show you forgiveness and greatness.